Our scripture reading comes from two places today. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 9 through 12, and Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. We'll first read Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 9 through 12. Believing that you are there, I'll read. You shall count seven weeks for yourself. You shall begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Then you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering of your hand, which you shall give just as the Lord your God blesses you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite who is in your town and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your midst in the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and yet you should be careful to observe these statutes. Now we'll read Acts chapter um, 2, verses 1 to 3. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire dist distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. This is the word of God. Hallelujah. Uh, thank you so much for the moving choral anthem and also the praise songs by our praise team um, for preparing our hearts for the service today. Um, so first of all, Happy Feast of Harvest. <laughs> feast, in Hebrew word, there are actually two words that describe feast. One is moed, and the other is hagag. Moed means appointed time. Although we human beings are not quite familiar with God's calendar, today is actually a time that's appointed by God so that God and we can meet together. Okay, it's a special feast. Today is one of the three major feasts, so hallelujah, right? The word hagag actually means festival, you know, like big party. So as we read in our main text in Exodus chapter 23, today is one of these, those days. We have a great feast, great joy. And I pray it's not by our might or by own effort, but our Father God's unchanging grace and his inspiration, the Holy Spirit be with us so we can truly render a worship with true faith in the appointed time and the faith in great festival as it is today. Amen. Um, as we have learned from our first or second main service today, uh, Pastor Lee talked about what Feast of Harvest is. It's actually 50 days from the time of Passover. Okay. And then... Uh, time actually the day of he explained in detail so from the day of the deliverance of Egypt on the Passover until the next 50 days we are going to actually visit the actual birth scene of where the feast of harvest took place okay in history right okay that is actually Sinaitic covenant very first time God proclaimed the feast of the harvest was actually on the Mount Sinai. So this is part of God's covenant with the Israelites, okay? But before we start, covenant is something that we really have to pay attention to, this word, okay? Every covenant in the Bible points at two things. Whether it's in the Old Testament or New Testament, majority of them in the Old Testament, because Old Testament is known as Old Covenant. Testament means promise, right? So all these promises are pointing to two things. One, crucifixion of Lord Jesus Christ to atone for our sins. Second, is a kingdom of God. Many Christians today, they understand the New Testament. They understand this beautiful promise that Jesus makes. But many of us are not very familiar with the Old Testament. But I have to tell you, until we are fully assured how Jesus Christ really came as the promised son, means 
He really came just as God prophesied thousands of years ago. Then we will realize this man is God. Remember, Israelites were not able to recognize Jesus Christ because he was human. They were not able to recognize Jesus Christ because they did not understand the Old Testament. They did not understand Moses. So many times in the Bible, Jesus said, if you don't believe in what Moses wrote, you're not going to be able to believe in me. So today, let us realize the importance of the Old Testament. And we are so blessed to be part of Pyongyang Jiu Church and all the churches of the world around the world because our, t our church really invests a lot of time in teaching the Old Testament to prove that Jesus Christ is really the Son of God. Amen? So let's actually turn to a few verses. Let's turn to John chapter 5, verse 46 through 47. John chapter 5, verse 46 to 47. Let us actually recite these words in faith. Okay? Ready? Begin. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Right? How much do we believe in the Old Testament? We don't understand in the Old Testament, there is no way we can really believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself said this, right? Okay. What are the books that Moses wrote? They're called the Pentateuchs, right? The five books of Moses. First, Genesis. Second, Exodus. Third, huh? Leviticus. Fourth, Numbers. Fifth, Deuteronomy. These five books. So this means... All of these part of the five books which are written by Moses are speaking of whom? Jesus Christ himself. Okay. And we are going to actually go to the scene where Moses received this word from God. Okay. Through his eight ascents of Mount Sinai. Okay. Right. So let's go to um, another factor before we go in. Reverend Evan Park wrote the seventh book of his redemption series. And he called this book entitled the entire book as the Ten Commandments, right? But he didn't only say Ten Commandments. He said this is covenant for all generations, which includes us. This is a very a powerful, impactful statement. He's saying this covenant that took place 3,000 years ago, if you don't understand the Old Testament, yes, it will remain as ancient covenant only between God and Israelites, but if you really understand this covenant in Jesus Christ, then you know this covenant still holds its efficacy right now, today. Not only now, but all the way to the end of the days. Okay. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. Okay. Let's read. It's actually, I prepared a slide so that we can quickly read through because this stuff is actually a big, really dense, okay? So Isaiah 41 verse 4, God says, Who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. God is saying he called all the generations from when? From beginning. In Korean translation, it's a generations for thousands of generations. God has called all the generations from the ancient days all the way up to this point, right? So because God called each and every one of us, each and every one of the generation, that same God, of course, is a sole governor of all the history of those generations. Amen? Right? Everything that happens in the life of these generations are controlled by whom? By God himself, because he's the one who called, right? Therefore, when God ratifies the covenant of the Sinaitic, Mount Sinai covenant, he says this, this covenant is not only for those, is not only for your ancestors. This covenant is not only for you right now who's alive listening to this covenant. This covenant is even for those who are not born yet, who are not with us now. Okay, shall we check this first? It's in Deuteronomy, chapter 29, verse 14 through 15. Let's carefully check this first. What is God saying? You see, Sinai covenant, for this reason, is so important in life as Christians, right? It holds eternal efficacy. 
So Deuteronomy 29, verse 14 through 15, let us read together. Ready, begin. Now, not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath, but both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. That's me, right? I'm not there with them right now in 1446 B.C. or 1407 B.C., right? We are right here. God has already included us in this verse, right? So this is the eternal covenant for all generations, as Book 7 is entitled. So let us look how did Moses ratify this covenant on our behalf. By this, you already know, Moses will foreshadow who? Our true mediator, our one and only mediator, only perfect man, the only God, Jesus Christ. Okay, let's put our goggles on and see how we can see Jesus through Moses, all right? Okay, so Exodus. What really, really impressed me was the dates. We just say that this is actually an old history, right? And something that may be like a myth or legend. Something, okay, that happened, but we can't really prove if it really happened. Can you really prove in your hearts it really happened? Uh, still, we have a glimpse of shadow in our hearts, right? But see, what Satan does is he tries to blur the actual historical dates of these events that took place in the Bible so that we will stumble in truly believing in the word. So here comes the man of God, Reverend Evan Park, through his rigorous um, solitude in Mount Jiri for three years and six months and seven days. He actually wanted to find out I really want to believe in the word of God. This is really word of God, right? And so God has given enlightenment through the Holy Spirit, actual dates of every event that took place in the Bible. And that is what we are receiving right now. So let's actually trace through the Bible. There are dates. We just didn't see them before, okay? So first, the Exodus was a historical event. Bunch of slaves who have been under bondage for 400 years are suddenly freed in a matter of 20-some days. That is a miracle in itself, right? That date did not just come about randomly, but it was actually pointed by God according to Gen uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 to 41. At the end of the promised 430 years, the Israelites really came out. Every moment, every second was dated. And what day was this? The first month, the 15th day, okay? And this one's actually Thursday. Uh, Thursday, okay? This is found in Numbers 33, verse 1. So from Exodus, they take how many days, and they come to finally the wilderness of Sinai. Okay? And when they arrive in the wilderness of Sinai, also the date is presented. It is actually the third month, on that very day, the Bible says. Actually, in Hebrew expression, it means the very first day of the month, okay, new moon. So it's third month, first. I, you, know, you know, I'm not saying January or March because this is a Jewish calendar, okay? Now, so this, was hap this happened to be Sunday. And this is found in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. So from here, Moses the next day, from the third month, second day, he goes up to Mount Sinai the eight times. Even the Jews, actually I was referring to some of the uh, writings that took place like 1800s by the rabbis and, and actually also the uh, Messianic Jews who actually trace back their own history. They cannot figure out exactly how many times Moses went up into Mount Sinai because the events seem to be just everywhere, random. In Exodus, in Deuteronomy, is this before or is it after? They seem all mixed up, right? But it's been straightened out completely by the author of the History Redemption series. So let's take a look at this, okay? Now, first, uh, first ascent, second, third, fourth, fifth, oh, seventh, and eighth. 
So it goes like this. So they arrived on the, th on the third month, first day. Now, the very next day, third month, and second day, which will be? What day? Monday. Monday is when it began. Okay? And next day will be, next time he went up was third month, third day on Tuesday. And then he will skip one day. And I'll, I just skip one day and I wrote four. Oh, thank you. And the fifth, okay, so skip to Wednesday, skip, right? Okay, let's write down. Okay, so this will be Thursday. Thank you. And then next day will be? This is easy, right, if you remember like this, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Just start with this. <laughs> it's in the Bible, right? And then the fifth time he went up was? Elect number seven. This is Saturday. Okay, and then now six, seven, eight, he has three 40 days of trip to Mount Sinai. Okay, there are 40 days. So this one is from the 8th, which will be Sunday, to 4th month, 17th day, which is Thursday. 30 days. Okay. And then, so this is 40. And then he comes down from the Mount Sinai. He goes back up on the next day. How old is he? 80, okay. Do you know how high Mount Sinai is? 2,291 meters, okay? Uh, when we went to Kenya, we went to this plateau called Kinengop. It was actually as high as mountain Baekdu, which is our mountain in North Korea, okay? That it was around 2,700 meters high. And when I just like squat down and stood up and reached something, I was already out of breath. <laughs> it was pretty tough. Okay, and here a man of God goes up and down and up and down, crazy, right? You can see, you can see that God's power and might was with him, right? You can see how a man has to suffer so much for behalf of all the nation of God. You can see how hard it is, right, to make a promise with God. We just you've received it so so comfortably, right? But it took a lot of sacrifice of someone. Okay, it's foreshadowing who? Jesus Christ. Okay, so, okay, let's ch uh, check the date again. Now, this is from the 8th. So, this will be Friday. Sorry, I ran out of the board. And then, from 228th. This is Tuesday. Okay, it's 30 days. You may wonder, oh, wait a minute, this is from number eight, number seven, this is 40 days, but this is eight to eight, what's going on? I asked this question, I was like, oh, this is wrong, right? Actually, you have to consider there are 29 days in a certain month and 30 days in a certain month, okay? So first month, third, all the odd numbers have 30 days, even number month have 29 days. That's where you see the difference. Don't fall asleep on me on it yet, okay? <laughs> we haven't even started, okay? And the eighth day, Actually, we skip one day here. Something happened. Okay, so Wednesday. So, and then from 30th, which will be Thursday, unto 7th month, 10th day, which will be uh, Monday. Begin with Monday, it ends with Monday. Okay. So these are 40 days. So how many days, okay, math time, did Moses take total to ratify covenant for Israelites? Easy. 40 days plus 40 days plus 40 days, right? So we have 120 days. And day one, two, three, four, five, six. And missing seventh day. So total 100 and 27 days. Okay, let us unfold what is happening. Okay. So let's turn to first day. They arrive finally in Mount Sinai, uh, wilderness of Sinai. So here is a mountain. At the foot of mountain here. 
This is again 2,291 meters. All right, so Moses goes up the first day on the third month <laughs> and the second day. Here, God proposes, hey, let's make a covenant. What are we, right? Our God, Almighty God. He says, let's make covenant. And who's making covenant with God? The Israelites. Do, do you know there is a repeating expression that God says, remember you were slaves in Egypt, right? God is trying to emphasize who we were before this day of making the covenant with God, right? Who were we? Slaves in Egypt, right? So when God proposes to make covenant, he said, please don't think it's because of your righteousness that I'm making covenant with you. Israel is actually the smallest number in the entire world. You have no righteousness before you. You're just a slave, right? But I am making covenant with you because of my promise with, with who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. So that is what he's saying. So here, God says, um, I will make you, the covenant is this, I will make you uh, my possession. This is segula in Hebrew word. Although we are just slaves, we have no righteousness in us, God says, I'm going to make you segula. Segula means a crown jewel. Not just any treasure, but crown jewel. Means the best of the best, right? And then he also says, you're going to become my kingdom of priests. Kingdom of priest. The word kingdom actually comes from the word meleka. Okay. The word melek means king. So what this means is that Israelites will become priest. Priest means what? A person who's in between God and man, right? That means as an individual or as a nation. What do we do? What do priests do? Can they go out in the world and live? No, right? The only thing the priests do the entire lives is to serve God and also serve the people. That means the whole nation is Israel. Their job was to help all the nations come to God. That was their role as a nation, right? But what do the Israelites do? Because I am chosen of God, the Samaritans must be burned in the fire because of all the sins, right? They did not understand this what kingdom a priest is. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, what does God say? Today in Christ Jesus, all of us are the priest. But what kind of priest? Don't forget, we are kingdom. Kingdom means kingship. Those who truly serve as God's priest will become king. They'll have this dominion and sovereignty to rule over the entire world. That was a promise that God made with Israel, right? What's amazing is that the founder of Korea, long, 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 long time ago, in Korean word, his name is Tangun Wangkom. Okay? Let me just write it down. Tangun Wangkom. The word Tangun actually means priest. Okay? Wang Gom, Wang, Korean, is king. Wang Gom means king. So already the founder of this nation, actually we were one of the few nations who worshipped heaven. The founder, his name also was king priest. Right? So Korean, as a heritage, we are part of the king priest people. Right? And by spiritually, we are also... The king, priest, people, right? How amazing is this? <laughs> Am I the only one who's amazed? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so we are like, so, so imagine, so Moses went up this day and he came back down. <gasps> he went up, came back down on the same day. And you see that, oh, let me give you the verse. This isn't actually, let me, 
this, we don't have enough time, so let's just go like this. Exodus chapter 19. All of this is Exodus chapter 19. Okay? The detail. So he comes back down. He's like, hey, God told me on the top of the mountain that he's going to make us Segula. He's going to make us Mekala. He's going to make us a kingdom. And the priest, whoa, do you want it? What do you think people say? Who wants to say no, right? Everybody's like, yeah, yes, I'm in, I'm in. We'll do just as the Lord said. So what does Moses do? Next day, remember, what is Moses? He's a mediator. There's no telephone at the time, okay? There's no cacao. So what does he do? He gets this answer from the people, and he goes all the way back up to Mount Sinai again the next day. God, 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 this is what people said. They said yes, yes, yes. That really happened. You know, I did not know this importance of mediator in our lives. I thought I was so arrogant enough to think that I could just go to God. But that's not the case. We can talk to God and call him our father because of who? We have this mediator, Jesus Christ. Okay? There's only one mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. One and only perfect man, perfect God, who is Jesus Christ. Let us give thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Because of him. We don't have to go up to Mount Sinai eight times, you know? You don't have to go up to Jiri to understand this Bible, right? <laughs> I heard this um, funny uh, example Pastor Philip always, always gives. He always explains how Reverend Evan Park read the Bible 1,800 times, right? And we're like, whoa. And there's one clever guy um, who came and said, oh, I'm so happy. I'm so blessed today. I was like, why? I did not read the Bible that many times. But because I studied the word of redemptive history, it's the same as I have read Bible 1,800 times because I'm learning from a man who read the Bible 1,800 times, right? So we are like, oh, that is so true. How come we never gave you thanks for it like this, right? So be proud. Be thankful of this precious word that we received, right? So here, now let's go to, so what do you think God responded? Oh, God, people said, okay, so let's, let's do it. So God says, hold on, hold on. You must consecrate yourself. Consecrate. For three days. Okay. I will make covenant with you. I myself will come down on the mountain. Because I'm coming down on the mountain physically, you make sure everybody is consecrated for three days. On the third day, I will be with you on Mount Sinai. That's what God says. Okay? So that's in, this is also still Exodus chapter 19, actually. Exodus chapter 19, verse 13. Okay? Yeah. 8 through 13. And here, one thing that I want you to notice is in chapter 19, so God comes down, right, and appears to Moses. But then he appears in thick cloud. If you notice, God never reveals himself throughout the whole time. People actually do hear his voice. Why do you think God will not show himself to Moses or to the rest of the people? Um, he came all the way down to, you know, do this, make covenant. Don't you think if God showed himself to us, it would be even more clear for us to believe in him? No doubt about that, right? But God doesn't do that. He, always, he says, I am letting your people hear that I'm speaking to you so that the people will believe in you. See, people turned their back against Moses because they could not trust in Moses. Same way, people of Israel did not believe in Jesus because he was only a human being, right? Jesus kept saying that, oh, I, you know, God, I only testify things my father tells me. Same thing. Why do you think God chose this way? The only reason God will not talk and will not show himself is that only the word will be exalted. People will believe in God not by seeing, but by hearing the word of God and believing in the word. Because God is the word in the beginning. As John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says, right? So if you cry out today praying that, oh, let me see God, then I'll believe you, then maybe you have to kind of change your mind a little bit and change your prayer, right? Just teach me how to believe in you. 
then he will make, your, make sure his voice be heard in your mind, in your heart, that you will never, ever doubt again. Right? So that's what thick cloud means. So here, so, what, so he, Moses goes all the way up, 2,291 meters. He's like, oh, God, okay, people said, okay. And then God says, okay, go back down. Tell them to be clean. Do their laundry, all right? And so Moses goes all the way back down. The same day, he tells people, okay, this is what God said. Please do your laundry. Make sure you bathe yourself. He claimed, don't go near woman, blah, 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 for three days. So people said, yes, sir. So that's why we have one extra day out, okay? And then after, on the third day, right, finally, God is making his way down. And so Moses goes up. So what happened is, okay, let me, let me draw like this Thursday. So here, Mount Sinai and God came. Okay, so that you remember. And then, so Moses like, okay, this is the day on the third day. We're going to go, la, 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 and go up, right? And then here, God says, hey, did you tell the people that they cannot come to the mountain? And we're like, what? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm coming down, right? Anybody who sees me in well and midst of sin, will, I will break through them, God says. Make sure they're consecrated. Warn them they cannot come near to this holy mountain. So with all this great anticipation, he goes up, but he comes back down. But actually, before he comes back down, Moses, with his human mind, he said, well, God, but I already told them very well that if you see God in a state like this, and you'll be killed. So make sure don't come near this. I told them. I'm sure they know. And God got really angry. He says, no, go back down. Warn them. They cannot come near the mountain. It sounds very harsh, right? But what is God trying to do? We already know this day, this Third month, sixth day, Friday was an extravagant day. It's a big day. God is making his covenant with the Israelites, right? So until this day comes, he doesn't want anybody to die. God is trying to preserve every soul possible. Perhaps you get ignorant. Perhaps you think you're confident. I'm clean. I did my laundry. So I can go, go, go come closer to God. God doesn't want to lose any single soul. So he makes a stern warning. And this is found in chapter 19, verse 6 through 19. Okay, so people for these three days, they're fully consecrated. They know they cannot approach the mountain of God, right? And then finally, on this day, God comes down on the Mount Sinai. There is a flash of thunder, lightning. You know, just there's fire on the mountain. People were so scared just looking at the mountain, right? And God spoke. This is Exodus chapter 20. He gives finally the Ten Commandments. Okay. And from chapter 20 and 21 and 22, I believe all the way to 23, God gives 10 commandments here, and these verses, he gives all the specific laws, okay? So, and all the um, patterns of the tabernacle and all these things, okay? And so here, when God came down, for the first time in world history, God spoke in his own voice to the people. So again, people did not see God, but they only heard his voice, and people Nobody had to tell them to be scared or have reverence. Just by hearing the voice of God, they felt like they are going to die already. This shows how a man with the sin cannot approach God. Naturally, we know that we will die. This is great of reverence, right? And so people say, oh, you know, just please don't let God talk to us. Otherwise, we are going to die. So can Moses please Go speak to God and receive the word from God and bring it back to us. So here Moses becomes a true mediator for all the people. Okay. Now, going back to the dating, right? This is the third month, sixth day, right? This is exactly 
the fiftieth day since the day of their deliverance from Egypt. Right. So this is the first month, fifteen days when they came out. Right. So this is the sixth day. So it's perfectly fiftieth day. You know what happens on the fiftieth day? As we learned during our main service today, this was actual Pentecost. Lord Jesus Christ, whatever he did, he never did anything by his own initiative. He did everything according to the promise of God. Just as God prophesied through Exodus chapter 12 when the lamb was killed, okay? That symbolized Passover Jesus Christ, right? And exactly 50 days after that, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the real Pentecost came down. The Holy Spirit really came down to the disciples. Do you see? So the dates and times God is moving precisely as he's planning, precisely as what God promised. This is what the dates prove. So let's look at a few verses to check this. Uh, let's go to actually Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 through 6. Let's look at the, what kind of promises that God made with the Israelites. Okay, 19, verse 5 through 6. Ready, begin. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is the covenant that God is making with us, right? If you obey my voice. Now let's go to uh, next verse. So when God spoke the Ten Commandments, it's exactly the 50th day, right? The say on that very day is when the promised Holy Spirit came down upon the people who gathered in the upper room of Mark. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Okay. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. You see, exactly the same as how it was on Mount Sinai. Right? God's thunderous voice. Right? This this, this scary, frightening sound of voice of God was spoken on this day. The same way, th what it came? The noise, like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were. Yeah, sitting. And the next, please. And let's read this together. Ready, begin. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So what is this Pentecost? It's a day to receive this noise like wind, right, from the heaven. This is also a day, this noise like wind from heaven is called what? The Holy Spirit. But just as what they heard, what did they, what, after they heard this, they were able to produce utterance, right? The same way. When the Israelites experienced Pentecost, what did they receive? The Ten Commandments. That's why Reverend Evan Park explained the seventh book. The entire Bible actually pivots around the Ten Commandments. Whole Bible is written by the Holy Spirit, right? Ten Commandments is a core in the Holy Spirit. But as Christians right now, because we're so ignorant in the knowledge of the Bible, when we say, Ten Commandments, it's like a loose that's choking our neck, right? Because if you commit it, you die. If you violate it, you die. We're only afraid of the Ten Commandments. We don't know the essence of the Ten Commandments. But that is precisely what Reverend Evan Park explained in the seventh book, through the word, ten words. Okay. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the Bible, this essence of the Bible, right? So when we receive Holy Spirit, it cannot be done without the Word of God, right? Holy Spirit must come with the Word of God. This is what God gave them, okay? So what happens the next day? Now that God uttered his word so that people can hear, and now that Moses mediated and delivered the Word of God to the people, the people are still exactly the same. They are slaves, right? But everything changed. 
because of ten covenant, ten commandments, because of the word of God, everything changed. And what happened is the next day, they will have a covenant ratification. So, oh, forget one thing. That night, Moses comes back down, right? Because every day he goes up and down, up and down. That night he came down and he relayed all the words to the people. And guess what he did? He wrote a book. Okay. Let's actually read this one. Oh, before we do, uh, I forgot the verse. Can we turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 15? What the Spirit, Holy Spirit actually is. The Ten Commandments, right? The Israelites received. Let's read this together. Ready, begin. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, right? They were slaves before. But now, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Because of the Ten Commandments that came down to them, they can now call God their Father. They're no longer slaves. And the next slide, please. Okay. And this is the first fruit of the Spirit. Okay. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Ready, begin. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So, brothers and sisters, Today is a feast of harvest. We learn it's actually 50 days, right? 50 days from the Passover, right? So exactly 50 days from this day of departure from Egypt, the Israelites received 10 commandments. This day, the third month, sixth day, this Friday, was a true feast of harvest. That is a day when we receive the 10 commandments. That is a day when we receive the Holy Spirit, right? The first fruit of the Holy Spirit. So what it does God want on this feast of harvest? We will see from this on. So next, so actually um, the Israelites actually go and they have this covenant ceremony. Now during this covenant ceremony, what happens is that, it, that Moses will read the book that he wrote all night long and he'll read this word to the people, and people will say, oh, this is the word of God. And they said amen to it. They will observe. And then he will take the blood and sprinkling, sprinkle the blood upon the altar, the sacrifices, and upon the people, and also on the book of the covenant. So this was actually made with blood. Signifying... Anyone who breaks the covenant will cost his life. Okay. This is a covenant of blood. But let's actually turn to this verse. Exodus chapter 24, verse 3 to 4. Okay, Exodus chapter 24, verse 3 to 4. Okay. Uh, you see, the part, let's, let's read it from verse 4, okay? Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Before he would just read them. So this one is very important because this shows the divine authority of the scriptures. What Moses wrote right here on this day is our Pentateuch in the Bible, right? Every word in the Bible was written precisely this way. Moses received the word directly from God, and he wrote it. As it is written in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. Okay. That's why Bible is perfect on its own. God says Bible itself is a prophecy. Okay, let's read this important verse. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. Ready, begin. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own, Interpretation. Why? Because no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by Holy Spirit spoke from God, just as Moses testifies, right? And therefore God says, search and look in the scripture, see if anything's missing. It's my perfect book. It's in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. Okay. This 
proves the divine nature of the Bible. This is called specific revelation of God. And you all have it with you, right? Okay, let's read. Ready, begin. Seek from the book of the Lord and read. Not one of these will be missing. None will lack its mate. For his mouth has commanded and his spirit has gathered them, right? That's exactly the birth of the very first Bible right here. Moses wrote, right? So this is something, every word here is what God spoke himself. Okay. So, and here, uh, we are running out of time, so we'll just skip this part. And then, after this, they will have a covenant meal with God. So finally, they're able to go up to the mountain. Uh, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders, these leaders, went up to the mountain. Remember, on this day, God was like, please don't come, right? Now, all of a sudden, after the word came down upon them, everything changed. Now they can come up to the mountain. Not only that, they can see God. Not only that, they can eat and drink with God. And God called them nobles. They were slaves before, right? But now nobles. So please believe, as the ones who have received the word of Jesus Christ, we have all been transformed into noble people, right? Who can have fellowship with God, who can eat and dine and do everything for the glory of God, glory of God. We have been made this already. Amen? Okay? So now after this, the question is, we think that this will be over, right? This should be over. They're done. They made a covenant, right? Okay. But it's not over. We know there are 40 days, 40 days, 40 days waiting here. Right? So I think because we're out of time, I'm just going to stop here. We are going to learn about the next 40 days, why this, these 40 days were necessary, right? Why doesn't God just stop here? They are called nobles. Now they can do it, right? They are covenanted people now. Okay. But here God says to Moses, let's just read one more slide before we close. Uh, Exodus chapter 24, verse 12. See, Reverend Evan Park presented this systematically for the first time in the world history. For us to revisit this whole thing in just a matter of 30, 40 minutes, I think it's impossible. So we're going to just stop here, but let's read one more verse. Exodus 24, verse 12. So this is chapter, um, right? Uh, let's see, it's 20 and it's 21. And here in 24, God says, let's read, ready, begin. Now the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and remain there. And I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment which I have written for there. Why is this necessary? You see, God says to remain here. Means Moses is not going to go down the same day anymore. Right? Why is two stone tablets necessary? Let's talk about this next time. Okay, let's close with a prayer. Our Father God, we thank you so much for bringing us to the Feast of Harvest. Although we come upon this day as if another day of the year, Father, you have already set this time apart as a great feast to meet you. Father, please open our eyes and help us to fathom your heart. How much you long to meet us. How much long, how much do you long for us to truly rejoice in you for the miraculous great work of redemption that you have done in our lives through Jesus Christ. Father, help us to truly believe in the work of Jesus Christ for everything that he did had been prophesied, been promised, and fulfilled accordingly. May we hear the word of God and grow in faith, which is enough to please you, Father, so that we will truly be able to transfigure and consummate together with the history of redemption in the end time. Father, bless every shallow member that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit this day. There are many things we don't understand yet. Sometimes the Bible becomes really dull to our heart. But please open our hearts and help us to hunger and thirst for your word, to wanting to understand, wanting to obey. May those echoes of the Israelites, we will obey the word of the Lord, be ours today. 
We thank you for this day of the Ten Commandments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give all the glory to our Father God.